Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reality Game Form Survivor Podcast. I am your host, Colin Connors, and joining me today is the wonderful Stephen Lehman. Good. Wow, well, I was going to say good evening, but I can't take that from Ty, so how the hell are, is everyone? How the hell is everyone? I like that. We also have with us Alex Cash. Howdy. And I bet you're wondering... What the hell is this? There's not a – there hasn't been a new episode. Colin's not talking to a new player. What are they doing? Well, I will tell you what we're doing. Me, Steven, and Alex have gotten together, and we're going to talk about the different first boots of Survivor history. Well, the first boot sets the tone for this season, and me, Steven, and Alex, we're going to talk about every first boot in Survivor history, the impact of what they did, and whether or not their being voted out was justified. So, guys, let's go to Borneo, and let's talk about – the wonderful, the amazing Sonia Christopher. Steven? She was a, she was a, in the words of Monica Culpepper, she was a neat lady. Um, you know, I thought she was a, you know, sweet. She, uh, she was probably the token older woman. And, um, I mean, you know, you felt bad for her when she was the first person voted out. But, I mean, you kind of saw it coming, too. Mm-hmm. Do you think uh, if she wouldn't have been voted out first, she would have contributed anything to the game? <laughs> Uh, I don't know about necessarily what she'd contribute to the game. Um, I, I certainly, I think she would have been a pre-merge boot in just about any scenario. Mm-hmm. Like so. if she were to come back uh, for Survivor Season 29, she would still be voted out pretty early. I'd assume so, unless she miraculously, you know, became a strategic yeah. force it to be It became a lot less annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alex, what's your thought on Sonya Christopher? Well... Uh, I think that she was one of the uh, – like this was back in the era when uh, Survivor allowed luxury items, and I think mm-hmm. her luxury item was one of the uh, most memorable because she used her ukulele to sing quite possibly the only song that I can think of that was uh, ever sung on Survivor probably because she made it up herself. Well, another first boot had a song they sung, but we'll get to that later. All right. But there was that. There was also uh, the little-known fact that I believe she was lesbian. Oh, wow. Um, we don't have confirmation on that, but that would be very interesting if she was because that would have uh, you know, set the precedent of having lesbian contestants way before Amy and Vanuatu. And she's you know, considered the first, I believe, true full lesbian. Uh, what I have to say about Sonia is I was glad they voted her out. No offense. But I and I didn't feel she brought much to the table. And Mark Burnett said after Sonia played, they no longer allowed musical instruments to be luxury items because of how annoying she was. I I, I have uh, I have uh, confirmation here that uh, that Sonia Christopher was indeed uh, one of that was indeed the first lesbian contestant on Survivor. Just oh. uh, it it never came up. Oh wow! What a knowledge bomb. Bam, that is a knowledge bomb. And now we do know, and now all you listeners know, that Sonia Christopher was in fact a lesbian. And I guess, it, is that her legacy? Or is the ukulele her legacy? I think the the ukulele is her legacy. The fact that the old people typically get uh, booted out first, or at least early, is also part of her legacy. Mm-hmm. She kind of set the standard for that. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on to Survivor, the Australian Outback, and this is a first boot that I know we're going to have a lot to say about, and that's <laughs> Deb Eaton. Uh, Steven, go ahead, drop some knowledge bombs for Deb Eaton on all um, of us. First of all, I do have to say, she absolutely rocks. Um, uh, yeah, for those yeah. who don't remember, she tried to build a shelter out of rocks, and you can get a shelter going with just some rocks. Um, some but- rocks. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, even though Deb only graced our screens for one episode, um, I, I still f- feel that that one episode we got from her was absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and as sad as it is to have Deb go out so early, you really had, you know, within the first five minutes of her sort of being kind of, I guess, bossy or so, mm-hmm. y- you knew she wasn't gonna make it any further. <laughs> and um. You know, she had a little bit of controversy after the show aired. Uh, do you want to highlight that, or are you, you aware know, of that? I, I, I'm aware of it. I'm not. I'm not too well knowledged in terms of it. I, did she? What was the whole thing? Did she have an affair with uh, her uh, stepson? Was um, that the supposed thing? 
I believe she um, divorced her husband and married her stepson. Okay. I believe that's what happened. Alex, do you have any info on this? Um, I do not at the moment. I, I can look it up. But I do remember, especially during the Australian Outback reunion, people were talking about Deb, and Deb was crying, basically saying, I wish I never played on this show. People have been saying mean things. And then Mitchell Olsen, who I interviewed, and you can listen to the interview on the YouTube page, stepped up and defended Deb, saying she was a really nice lady and that she was really misunderstood in the context of the show. But to me, Deb Eaton signifies the whole, if you don't fit in, you're fucking out early. It doesn't matter if you're physically fit or not. And I think that was really important for that to happen in Survivor because it really set the stage for Survivor being the social game that it is. Yeah. And, of course, her shelter full of rocks will always be... Oh, of course. That's (laughs) always one of the greatest Survivor moments even ever. And and I believe Spencer from this current season made a comment about this uh, shelter full of rocks early on in his bio. Alex, do you have any information on Deb? Uh, the um, the article I found, I'm I'm not sure uh, what actually happened, but uh, it would appear that the National Enquirer uh, reported that uh, she was uh, planning to marry her own stepson. Mm-hmm. But we don't have any confirmation of that. Uh, well, I, I I don't know I don't know if we have any confirmation of that yet, but I do know that uh, the rumor was widely reported enough that uh, that she had some trouble with it. Mm-hmm. And would Deb deserve a spot in a second chance season? Yes or no? <sighs> no, <laughs> we we don't want to see her again. I mean, I, I of course you know if it was you know one of those first boot exclusive things sure i'd like to see her come back no i'm talking about second chances in terms of anyone pre-merge really no if it was exclusively second chances i don't think she would be one of the people i would choose unfortunately i mean that seems about right and i think honestly she wouldn't come back yeah Yeah, i think after the whole scenario scandal that happened with that it makes sense and i mean this is such an old school season of survivor i mean this aired in the year 2000 can you believe that Anyways, are we guys ready to move on to Survivor Africa? Let's move on to Survivor Africa yes. with the wonderful Diane Ogden. Um, maybe it's just the fact that she was the first boot, but I don't remember too much of her. Do, do she, either of y'all have a lot to say? I don't Steven? remember much about her either. I, you know, the only reason I remember Africa so well is because it was my first season I watched full through on air way back when. Um, but I remember Diane, she and Clarence, uh, split, I believe it was a can of beans. Oh, uh, yes. And Very early uh, on. She, she because was she was supposedly under the weather. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can't remember the whole particulars behind it, but I believe it was where Diane was sick and Clarence in order to, I guess, make her feel better, opened mm-hmm. a can of beans and she didn't prevent him from doing it. And then she, I guess she may have tried to stir some shit up. I, I can't remember exactly. Yeah. I, but. I, I think I think she screwed up at the challenge. First she first she was uh, bad at at uh, the challenge, and then I I think she uh, I, I think she basically keeled over afterwards, and mm-hmm. so that made her look weak. And I mean, we would later see this in Survivor Thailand, um, not with obviously the first boot, but. People who just are kind of sick being voted out. And it kind of, I feel like we're kind of robbed when that happens, but it also seems like the natural progression of the game that if mm-hmm. someone, you know, is sick, let's get rid of them. Well, yeah, be, well, not unless only it's to... Simar. Pardon, unless it's two? Uh, Simar from uh, Caramon. Shamar. Shamar, I'm sorry, Shamar from Shamar <laughs> Caramon. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think with the sick people, I mean, it makes sense. You don't want them to, to get any you know worse out there and you also don't want them dragging down the tribe so it yep. it's sort of a it makes sense i guess on two levels for me yeah. and i mean mm-hmm. i think it's interesting that you know diane was on Braun and ethan was on Braun and he wound up winning and i believe that was the same case of sonia and it's the same case with uh Bisepia, who won survivor marquesas and do you guys think it's time to move on to peter harkey because i think it's time i to have a lot to say yeah. about marquesas okay so let's talk about peter harkey 
that first episode, he's edited as kind of a leader and a little bit of a goofball. And you see his yoga technique to start the fire. And I didn't catch this until my rewatch of our cases, which was that Peter Harkey was kind of doing everything right. He didn't seem to be making too many mistakes. Like, he wasn't ostracizing himself. And, in fact, um, when Rob was on – Rob Mariano was on Rob Has a Podcast and was asked about Hunter – Rob even said, my greatest accomplishment wasn't getting Hunter voted out third. It was getting Peter voted out first. Huh. Because apparently Peter was just a good influence on the tribe. So, Stephen, let's talk about Peter for a little bit. Well, based on what we were shown of Peter, he was <clears> – <throat> excuse me. He was a, a little out there because I remember he mm-hmm. – very well that he talked about uh, the orifices of the body a lot. Mm, yep. Um, that was, and then, um, I believe he and Sean had a few spiritual moments as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but those were honestly the two things I remember most about him. And, um, you know, he did seem to sort of, I guess, I don't want to necessarily say ostracize himself, but Mm -hmm. I, it came off really odd to me. I don't know. Mm hmm. Um, well, do you think that was just the editors trying to justify the boot, or do you actually think he was that odd? Because from the way Rob tells the story was that, you know, Peter Peter was a little odd, but wasn't, you know, that too bad. And it was a five to two to one vote. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, go ahead, Alex. Uh, the I, I know more about a fictional version of Peter Harkey than the real thing, because uh, um, Mario Lanza, the... Uh, writer of the funny 115 mm-hmm. uh, also had a series of uh, uh, sur- uh, had a series of survivor uh, fan fictions back in the day where he brought back all-star contestants and he was like the first person to do that and he had a second chances season and uh, he actually got to talk to Peter uh, a lot and uh, deve- mm-hmm. and develop that character and so based on how, how that how that went uh like it it's it's easy uh what i saw was that um peter kind of was hoping to use that goofy personality as sort of a cover for actually knowing what he was doing mm-hmm. and uh that he was and that uh he he probably could have made it very far if he hadn't been uh rooted out by boston rob and the like mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I, so I like him as a Peter goofy character, and I like him as a uh, what could have been. Yeah, well, that's the thing is, should Peter come back? I mean, when we talk about Marquesas, we always go, "Oh, Hunter needs to come back." And there's even the rumors that Hunter was asked for heroes versus villains. Yeah, but I, it's like, but it's like Peter. Shouldn't we be talking about Peter? I feel like Peter is one of the most overlooked for, first boots. I would, I yeah, I'd be okay with seeing Peter play again. Mm-hmm. What about you, Alex? Oh, hey, yeah. So we go from Peter Harkey, who is an overlooked first boot, to what I think was one of the very first genuine deserved first boots, which is John Raymond in Survivor Thailand. Um, (laughs) I don't have much to say. The stories of him ostracizing himself, those were true. Um, He was famous for telling his church congregation before the season aired that he was voted out first. Um, Oh. I I don't know. I I don't really have that much more to say about John. Um, this, he, I think he had a bit about like telling the tribe that the water well had Paris. I don't know what the hell he did, but something involving. I remember he did something well, involving he the fa- water well. He found he found like a puddle or something like that, and said and it was joked the well. to everybody that it was the water well, and, and no, uh, nobody led was people along for a little bit. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I don't. I honestly, John. I have no. I don't mean any disrespect towards him, but I. You know, if you asked me to say anything he did relevant to the season, I mm-hmm. I couldn't tell you. And I feel like in any scenario season he would play, he might not necessarily be the first person voted out, but he, he would be a pre-merge. And that's something I kind of want to talk about with all these people is whether or not they would just be tossed to a side in any random season or if they have a real chance. I feel like someone like Peter has a real chance of going far in a season, whereas, you know, people like John or Diane, they're fucking pre-merge boots, no, really, no matter how the cookie crumbles. Unless they get super lucky, yeah. I feel like with John is, you know, he may he may have been somewhat competent in the challenges, but I think with um, the ostracizing he did, 
and his, I guess, his inability to sort of mesh with the other people in his tribe. I, I don't think he'd fare well, really, on any season. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I definitely concur. Alex, do you have anything to add about John? Um, uh, I'm I'm trying to remember. I don't remember quite what it was, but I think that uh, um, Brian, uh, as, as part of his strategy, he was he was gunning. Uh, for John, John did John did some of the work in uh, in getting himself out, but uh, Brian also kind of uh, I, I think he uh, uh, tried to use that first boot as a way to unify everyone else and of course solidify his control over the mm-hmm. tribe uh, because I, I think he got the got the feeling that John might have been trying to lead and that he wanted that leadership position definitely. so he could ma- maintain control. So uh, uh, John was definitely was at least in part Brian's decision to go first when they had somebody who was uh, sick. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, and I definitely concur. So. We go from Survivor Thailand to Survivor Amazon, and I want to point out that this was the very first time Survivor Amazon where the first Boots tribe, someone from that tribe, did not win the game. Ryan Aiken was uh, on the men's tribe, and of course, Jennifer Um, Asker won Survivor Amazon. Now, actually, Colin, I've got to stop you there, because in Australia, Kucha was the first tribe to... Uh, Yeah, but Tina wound up winning, and she was from Oko. Oh, am I wrong? Oh, yeah. I am wrong on that. I am sorry. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I, I thought I looked at that carefully, but I didn't. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. I, hey, if I say something wrong, I expect to be fact-checked. That's why I'm here with you all two instead of just rambling into this microphone by myself. <laughs> Nevertheless, though, let's talk about Ryan Aiken from Survivor, the Amazon. I remember him, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, as the guy who tried to overplay and got his ass handed to him. I, You know, I, you know, I, I think that's it. Uh, but, I mean, I'm partial to him because, according to Wikipedia anyway, it says he's from uh, Ellicott City, Maryland, which is about 20 minutes or so from where I live. So um, I, I'm partial to him for hometown biases in a sense, but he really, you know, he, he messed up bad. I think if he had just, um, you know, went along with a Roger boot instead of trying to, I guess, you know, think further on down the line, I very well think he probably could have made it a little bit further. Yeah. But what's uh, interesting is that in a newer season, his kind of thinking seems to be the norm. So if he were to, say, play Survivor 29, he might not necessarily have shot himself in the foot. Alex, go ahead. I want to hear your opinion on this. Uh, I think I remember Rob C. Uh, having said uh, in some podcast at some point that Ryan Aiken had literally just started watching the show before he before he got out there, and he had absolutely no idea what he was doing. He was... <laughs> <laughs> the least knowledgeable person in the entire game about the show. Uh, oh. So it, it's not surprising that he shot himself in the foot because he uh, uh, didn't know how not to, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything else? I, I, I can't think of that much. I mean, Ryan getting booted kind of set the precedent for that season to be wild and crazy, especially with, you know, Rob Session, you know, flip-flopping Alliance. So I guess Ryan's boot was good in that regards, but anything else? I I can't think of anything else besides yeah, that. Yeah, neither can I. So let's move on to another season, the next one, which is ah, yes. Pearl Islands, in which Nicole got voted out first. Um, I remember her for being good-looking, and that's it. <laughs> I, um, I remember Nicole because she got voted out for playing too fast too soon. I remember I, her too. I I think what she I think what she did was she told like Lillian and Tawana that uh, each other were the targets, and then they talked to each other and figured that Nicole was shady as hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I remember because um, I actually did a rewatch of Pearl Islands not too long ago. Fun fact. Um, and she, uh, yeah, she basically went up to Lillian and was like, "So uh, I'm trying to get Tawana off because she's shady and loud." Um, and then Lillian, being the strategic goddess that she is, runs yeah. up to Andrew Savage, and this is a side note because I absolutely adore Lillian, um, but she's like, yeah, Nicole went up to me and was like, we need to get Tawanda off, um, and that's another <laughs> fun little Lillian voice gem <laughs> that she calls Tawana Tawanda, um, 
and so you know everyone's able to put two and two together and they find Nicole out. So and they kick her ass out early on. Over now, Ryan S. Now Stephen and Alex, do you think this voting out of players who are overplaying kind of set the precedent for the kind of slower, uh, slower gameplay we see in the seasons and the next couple of seasons following, and you know in Guatemala, in Palau, in Vanuatu. Do you think the fact that all the people who are really strategic right off the bat are getting the boot, do you think that's I plays th- a part of it? I think more than that, it, they they come off too strong. Um, mm-hmm. It's not necessarily that they are strategizing, but they're over strategizing, mm-hmm. where you where they're telling too many people too many different things, yeah. and people are able to put you know two and two together and realize that you know, oh, this person is lying to me. So. Mm-hmm. Do we have anything else on Nicole? I f- I think not. Anyways, we are going to skip Survivor All Stars because I mean, <laughs> Tina Tina just got the short end of the stick. We can all agree on oh, that. Not- she was an old lady, um, and she already won her season, so she is by no means in the same category. She was as- too good for them. That's what yeah. I like to think. Yeah. <laughs> too good for them. Yeah, well, we, we the can talk. Is- we uh, we can talk about uh, Tina during a uh, winners podcast. During edition. a winners podcast, and I completely agree. I mean, she is not in the same category as all these other people, and all star seasons are different from normal seasons. So let's move to Survivor Vanuatu, which had one of the most interesting first boots, I would argue, of any of these seasons, and that's Brooke Gendry being voted out first. I mean, here's this strong male on this all male tribe. And he got eaten alive by the Fat Five. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, I don't know how well y'all two know this, but Brooke was actually a huge fan of the TV show Survivor. And for all you listeners out there, if you listen to my interview with Sarge, Brooke still holds a grudge towards Sarge and the other members of the Fat Five for voting him off. Brooke has actually said things like voting him off first has you know, ruined his life. You know, I, I, I don't think he feels that way now, but at the time he was extremely upset. I mean, he was a super fan and he got the boot first. Mm. Steven. You know, I, I, I'm partial to the fat five because I like to think that, you know, because they're an alliance of older, larger gentlemen that, you know, it was cool to see them take power. And I mean, I felt bad for Brooke in the sense that, you know, he was such a big fan and, he got the boot first, but I, I mean, I honestly, I can't say much more about him because that's all I remember it was that he was the target of the Fat Five and he wound up, you know, getting booted. Yeah. What about you, Alex? Do you have anything else to add? Um, not really, because I think I think the uh, the story I remember from the premiere episode of uh, Vanuatu when it came to. Uh, how how the first Lopevi vote was going to go down was ha- was how it was framed more in terms of how Chris extricated himself from uh, the situation of being targeted because he was god awful on the balance beam. Right, mm-hmm. it's more of a how Chris survived than why Brooke left. I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I actually kind of want to see Brooke come back for another season. I want to see if the super fans really got it. Mm-hmm. That's my personal opinion. All right, so let's move on to Survivor Palau. Now, it's kind of hard to determine a real first boot for Survivor Palau, but we're going to go with – um. we're kind of going to talk about both Jonathan Libby and Wanda because they were both not picked. So they never really got a chance to play. Let's start off with Jonathan Libby. Kobe wanted him gone. Kobe got him gone. <laughs> Jonathan was pissed. Um, Anything else? I remember – literally, I could tell you the one thing I remember about Jonathan was that I think there was a sob story that he had one ball, but I'm not sure. I'm what? Not, what? I, Alex, I, you can have to fact check that. I you had to fact swear check that. I, I read it. Hang on. I'm Googling it now. You guys read that Jonathan Libby only has one testicle. Oh, my god. Um, <laughs> uh, Diagnosed with and cured of tes- testicular cancer in early 2005. Uh, huh. This season, uh, it aired in filmed in late the the season filmed in oh. late two thousand four. So, okay. uh, so Jonathan did not have the sob story then. Okay, is that correct? He he, get... he may have had he may have had the uh, the the makings of the sob story. That's true. 
That would just well, wouldn't that just pull at your heartstrings though? A young athletic male with one ball. Who, oh, poor guy. Well, I think this podcast is denigrating quickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> strategically, though, did Kobe even achieve anything by going after Jonathan? And I think looking back on it, it's just Kobe flaunting his wings, which explains exactly why he was the first person voted out uh, come the merge. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah. What did he really gain from it? I mean, you could argue maybe that Jonathan was, like, a tough, strong guy, but, like, even then, I don't necessarily, you know, see what the point of that was. Yeah. And, um, I heard the reason why... The reason why uh, Karen even picked Willard over Jonathan was simply because Karen wanted to make sure that there was an older person on the tribe. Besides So her. that way that person would be the first boot besides her. So... <laughs> Did Kobe even play a part in it, or was it just edited that I way? I think Alex. Oh. Alex, do you have an opinion on it? I think that with twenty people all living on one beach, there is going to be way too much going on for there to be for us to ever be able to figure out what all happened. Uh, even if they had a whole episode just for just for the day before the uh, the tribe pick happened, so. I think that Kobe might have played a part in it. I think there may have also been 10 other things that played a part in it. Okay, guys, so let's talk about Wanda. Um, she is the other famous Survivor singer, and unlike Jonathan, I completely understand why she wasn't picked. She was a weak, <laughs> older, annoying lady. Would, would there be any strategic value for keeping that around that this early in a game? The, the th- aforementioned thing with Karen. That that is that is literally the only reason. It is perfectly acceptable to to take on one older, weaker person onto a tribe uh, to have an easy first boot that isn't you. It's when that becomes a pattern that it becomes a problem. So, do you think she should have been picked? I think she should have been picked because of her entertainment value. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because uh, from what I fr- from the. Uh, uh, conspiracy theories that I've heard, uh, Wanda and Willard were kind of picked as intentional uh, people who wouldn't get picked, and they didn't foresee that uh, Jonathan would uh, uh, not get picked <laughs> instead of Willard. Well, well, why wouldn't they have picked Willard, though? Because he's an older male? Uh, yeah, basically. And that and he's also um, – that and two other reasons. One, that he wasn't a very good social fit on Karor, uh, as I remember. And second, that Willard would have already been there the whole time because he's the immunity idol. Oh, yeah, I remember that that whole thing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right, guys. So anyways, is it time to move on to survive Guatemala? Yes. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Jim Lynch, who was the astronaut, I believe, who was voted out – no, no, what, what that, was no, he? not Dan. an astronaut. God damn it, what was he? That's Dan from I, I can't remember what he I think he was a fireman? Refired, no? retired, retired fire captain. Retired there fire captain. So I was only extremely wrong about him. <laughs> like, I only picked the exact opposite occupation of a fireman besides a pyrotechnician. Anyways, <laughs> that's because... He didn't leave that much of an impact on me, and I remember doing my Guatemala rewatch uh, that I did recently that he seemed a lot more bitter than I remember. That's kind of <laughs> that's kind of what I think. I remember he hurt his arm, and then they kind of voted him out. It's like, hey, you're an old guy, and you hurt your arm. You bring nothing to the table. We have to get rid of you, which I completely well, understand. Steven, go ahead. And on top of that, they didn't really give him that much of a sympathetic edit. It was like old guy, former Marine – you sort of knew what you were doing, but, like, no one really cared, you know, um, and they, you know, they even drew straws to see who he was voting for. Um, so that's why when the episode aired, they never showed who he voted for. Um, but I believe in the voting tally, if I have that on me, uh, he threw his vote at Margaret. Mm-hmm. Um so. Well, I, I forgot they didn't show um, that who he voted for because he drew straws or the whole tribe apparently was going to – Yeah, I think it was like whoever drew straws would be who Jim was supposed to vote for. So it was pretty obvious that he was gone. Yeah. Yeah, Jim was the oldest 
person in that season by two decades. Holy shit. Yeah, he yeah, was he was sixty three. Margaret was forty three. So yeah, they. So I'm I'm not sure what he did not saw stand him to, to justify that. Uh, thinking that he was going to make it past uh first boot in a season that was uh that started off one of this, the hardest yeah. Ugh, the eleven mile hike in the jungle. Yeah. I don't know. I to, although to be fair, I guess you wouldn't necessarily go and assume that the first thing they're going to have you do is that 11 mile trek but i I mean you got to be prepared for everything exactly but even so i feel like he got a little bit of a raw deal but in all honesty if you were to play again i don't i don't remember anything he did socially i think he would also be pre-merged i think i i think he'd i'd wager to say he'd be first boot again you think he would be first boot again i i I mean unless his tribe won immunity Mm -hmm. yes what about you alex uh yeah, I I think I think he uh he's in his seventies now. If he came if he came yeah. back, that would be uh like yeah they're they're yeah I don't he's not see coming back. him he's uh, not. fitting. I I don't even see him being able to fit in socially with a mostly young cast. Yeah, yeah. Thing. exactly. Well, um, I feel like that's kind of it. We kind of you know talked about Jim. Any anything else anybody wants to add? No? Okay, well, let's move on to Survivor Panama Exile <sighs> Island, which has, in my opinion, if we have to bring back anyone for his boot, this Timbertina. Play, yeah, Timbertina, Timbertina really does deserve a second chance. And while this is not on the YouTube page right now, it will be on sometime in the future. Tina actually joined the Survivor Org podcast, well, back when we were the Survivor Org podcast, to talk about Survivor Caramoan. And she was an amazing, she was bright, she was colorful, and she kind of just got stabbed by Suri. And I think she had some potential to go for her. I don't know if she could win it. I mean, she is very outspoken, no offense, Tina. And she's very vivacious. But damn, you know, her fire got put out quickly, and she was going through a lot at the time of filming. Steven, let's go ahead and let's talk about Timber Tina. That was so heartbreaking. Um, uh, You know, I... As much as I I love Suri, I will defend her in Exile Island to the death. Um, but you know, I I really wish that they had not picked Timbertina to go. Mm-hmm. Um, no disrespect to Ruth Marie, but I I feel like the the season in terms of entertainment, in terms of just about everything, would have been so much better had Timbertina been saved. Um, she I just deserve. seemed like a genuinely. You know, just a really interesting person with a really great backstory. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you know, God bless. But, you know, her poor you know, son getting, uh, you know, killed in that car accident and then going on. And mm-hmm. she just had a lot of stuff that was going on with her. Yeah. And I, I don't know. It's just to me, it's just so heartbreaking that she was. Mm-hmm. And I mean, so she's, early. she's in your second she... chance season, right? Oh, easily. Easily. Easy. I, easy. Yes. Easily. She I think she's one of the very few contestants who you look at. And the thing about Survivor is a good portion of Survivor is luck. You look at someone like Timbertina and you just go, Yeah, you might not be able to win, but holy shit, there was really nothing you could have done. I mean right, well yeah, because you were stuck you were put on a tribe with, you know, Sari, who is who goes on to be like one of the most, you know, popular people in Survivor history mm-hmm. and with her Exile Island version. I mean, there was. Re- I don't really think there was anything Timbertina could have done differently that would have saved her, which is what's so sad. Mm-hmm. Couple, couple other uh, thing things about Timbertina. I think she was originally supposed to be on Guatemala, but she then was, pulled she out was because to... of the car accident. Yes, that's completely true. And with, uh, I, I think they replaced I, her I with Amy. One season later wasn't enough time for her to uh, recover emotionally from that. Um, yeah. And also, there's the. Uh, and also, uh, Tina was brought onto the Jeff Probst show during the run when Jeff Probst tried to have a daytime talk show. I and, remember that. And and she had a segment where she she chucked uh, she chucked axes at a target. <laughs> well, I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, it, she's it's doing clear well. that it's clear that the the uh, at least Jeff still remembers her. Yep. And goddamn, they need to bring her back. And the thing is, she seems to be. Very well adjusted. She's been doing extremely well. Uh, I remember when we talked when she was on the podcast, she was talking about how excited she was about doing other stuff. And 
Oh. I think we all just really feel bad for her. You know, we talk about some first boots like John Raymond, and it's like, okay, he sucked. No offense, John, <laughs> but it's like, and he's out. But then you get to someone like Tina, and that kind of shows the ruthlessness of the game Survivor. It's just, it's tough. Um, I, I think we're all extremely sympathetic, and we all want to see her play again. Absolutely. But will, could she win if she played again, though? I... I don't know if she could win. I could definitely see her being sort of a Sari esque edit, where she does very, very well and is very wildly popular, mm -hmm. but just falls just short. I could see that um, too. If she gets in a good alliance early on, she could place in the top seven or six. I could easily. see. I could see her being final four jury boot because Ooh, you I, know I she know can't she... win that last challenge and. Oh, God, I'm already envisioning it in my head, and it's it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. You see Andrew Savage beat her and win immunity and vote her out. And it's oh, God, season. stop. Oh, no. It's tough. Oh. It's tough. So anyways, guys, let's move on to Survivor Cook Islands, which I would argue has a um, <laughs> a less interesting first boots. I mean, Seku, he was interesting. We got to see him sing on Survivor, but for the most part, he was lazy around camp, and those girls on his tribe just – Wanted to axe his ass out early. Steven, your take on Seku? Um, you know, I was I, I can't lie. I I don't I don't dislike Seku at all. I, I, you know, I thought he was a fun character for being the, the you know, no offense cuz I feel like the, you know, they they were divided by race that season mm -hmm. and he was perceived as the laziest in his tribe and you know, he just you know, I, it made no sense to me why they would keep him. He wasn't, he wasn't that physically fit. In mm -hmm. comparison, he, um, he just didn't seem to gel with anyone except for Nate. Nate yeah, and um, I feel like Nate only kept him around because it was the other guy. And right. I mean, famously, it was a gender thing. Yeah, and famously during the reward challenge when they got to send someone, or it wasn't the immunity challenge when they got to send someone to exile. Yeah. It was Nate a, and Seku stepped forward. Yeah, Nate and Seku stepped forward, and by Seku doing that, he immediately put those three women in an alliance together and separated him and Nate. Yeah, and he sent Jonathan Penner to Exile Island in the process. Yeah. So, I don't want to see Seku again. No offense, I don't think he would. Um, I don't think he would bring anything different. Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say he'd be about the same. Mm -hmm. I don't see him. He may get a few rounds further. But I, I can't see him yeah. making a swap. Yeah, he wouldn't make a swap or a merge, merge by any chance. Alex, your thoughts? Um, well, I I think uh, I think one of the things that uh, allowed Seku to go first and allowed him to feel comfortable enough to uh, uh, separate fr from the rest of the tribe was because uh, um. The because the tribes were tribes of five, uh, so, some of the tribes had uh, two men and three women, and I think he just sort of assumed that as, as a man on a, on as one of two men on a tribe of three women that he would uh, be considered uh, a necessary physical presence when he really wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anyways, I think it's time to move on to Survivor Fiji. And I actually just found a TV Guy article with Melissa McNulty, and she seems <laughs> to be dressed in what would appear to be a Survivor-style bikini and a Survivor kind of photo shoot. And there is a conspiracy theory that Melissa actually quit on the very first day on the well, island. Is that true or not, guys? Because I, I don't believe it. Well, she – she is, so is, according is, to, the, is the conspiracy theory that she made it onto the yeah, island? Yeah, that she made quit? it on the island and the game started and then she quit and then they just refilled oh. the intro. Which I don't I, believe I, that. I don't believe that. Yeah, at I, all. Can't I, don't, I can't that believe that. That doesn't make any sense because I think I remember Jeff being on a boat with the castaways saying that. He exactly. wasn't with them, but he was flying over Fiji. He said yeah. the pressure or whatever was so intense that one survivor quit just before. And I actually think if Melissa made it onto that island and she quit, they would show that because because right. that's a testament to how hard Survivor is. And you know, right. they've never shied away from showing people quitting from how hard the game is. Right. It was also because she didn't. She never made it, technically speaking, onto the show. Exactly. Right. So let's talk about the real first boot of Survivor Fiji, which is Jessica. 
Debin. Debin? Debin? Debin. Deben. We don't know. Debin. <laughs> we don't know. Um, and in all the, the fans, capitalization makes me think Debin. Debin. Yeah. yeah. And I will be frank with you guys and the listeners. I ran her name through Google Image Shirts about two minutes ago because I realized I don't remember anything about her. So Stephen and Alex, I'm going to let you talk about her. I remember her for a few reasons. Um, one being I watched PG a month ago, so I have that fresh in my mind. And another because she is Jeff Probst's all-time favorite first boot. Yeah, uh, why? Uh I don't know. Um, she was on Ravu, who, mind you, was a shitty tribe with the exception of Sylvia, the overbearing older Asian lady who was an architect, mm-hmm. and Yao Man, who I I ball every time I watch Fiji and he gets booted. And but, in um, case any listeners want to, I did, in fact, uh, have a conversation with Yao Man, and you can hear it on the YouTube page. Anyways, continue, Stephen. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, Jessica, she – I think the whole thing with her boot was – uh, Ravu went to the first immunity challenge. Um, they lost it on, I believe it was the third of three puzzles that Jessica was assigned to do. So she, she bombed the challenge for them. But on top of that, um, her alliance consisted, consisted, excuse me, of herself, uh, Erica and Rocky. So three people who <laughs> weren't really all that, I don't want to necessarily gifted, but they weren't. They weren't as socially inclined as, you know, say, someone like Michelle or someone like Yao Man. Mm-hmm. Nor Earl. were they a majority in a tribe of nine people. <laughs> well, Brad Culpepper would say differently, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, I think with Jessica, she, you know, she may have gotten the short end of the stick, but if she did, I don't, I don't think we really care. Yeah, and they didn't explain it enough to make it memorable. Right. Um, they, they had Jessica throw her vote at Rita, who I guess was the supposed decoy boot. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rocky threw his vote on at Mookie. I can't, I can't. I think it was because he told Rita he wasn't going to vote for her. Yeah. And he told Jessica he wasn't going to vote for her, so he just threw on it. And then Erica voted for Yao Man. So they were in alliance, but they didn't even vote together yeah. at that first tribal council. Yeah. And <laughs> and if, if that was an attempt to uh, appear... Uh, a- appear like they weren't together. That has to be the lamest. <laughs> yeah, the worst. Well, attempt. When tossing the votes away, because I mean, we have s- six one one one. Yeah, the split. Not <laughs> even, not even close. Not even. Yeah. Close. Anyways, anyone have any other thoughts about Jessica? I know Jeff Probst does, and I, I think she's probably his prime candidate to play again. Yeah, well, I guess we're going to see her on second chances. I don't give a shit if she is or not. Um, <laughs> I know that sounds mean, Jessica, and I would love to have you on the podcast. And I believe we've spoken before, but I'm not 100% sure. Anyways, I think it's time to move on to Survivor China. Damn! And Damn! talk about Damn! my personal favorite <laughs> first boot, which is... Steve Chicken Morris. All right, guys. Mm-hmm. I want to hear your opinions before I go on a long chicken tandem. Um, my opinion, first of all, shout out to Chicken because he's from Virginia. So Virginia represent. Um, also, he's on Jean Hu, which is one of the, I guess, most clusterfucky tribes ever. Because you have Chicken, who is a godly first boot. You have PG, who is a scrappy underdog. You have Ashley, who's a wrestler. It, and, you know, you just have this colorful group of characters, and then there's Chicken. And you, you kind of – you got to love him because he he's this older guy who doesn't really gel with the rest of the people. But I don't know what it is about him, but I like him. I did not want to see him go at all. Yeah, I, I, I liked him. Uh, and uh, I will say that if you look at the uh, – like he, he, was, he was voted out for being – wishy-washy so the show would have you believe but if you look at the actual voting confessionals from survivor insider uh which today is the youtube clips Mm -hmm. um he was voted out uh for a lot of different reasons uh uh (laughs) um yeah you're not playing you act like you're not playing the game but you really are you're lying way too much uh uh, I did. I don't know who to who to believe. Uh, when, uh, 
about you. You're you're not much of a leader. Mm-hmm. You've been afraid. So so I think he just rubbed people the wrong way in general. Well, on a lot of different. What things. I have to say in his defense is something that I promised I will never do on Survivor. So his tribe gets to the you know to the island, and they go, "How do we build the shelter?" And Chicken's like. I build shelters for a living. Mm. Let me lead. And then everyone else goes, okay, he builds shelters for a living. We're ignoring you. Okay, who has ideas? And (laughs) he then disconnected himself from his tribe, which I understand why he did it. Of course, that's a horrible move. But, I mean, what else can you possibly fucking do at that point? It's like, hey, we need someone that can do math. Oh, you're a mathematician? Okay, we're going to go to the guy who runs a bowling alley. Like, I don't – I still will never understand that. I'm like, if someone can build a shelter, let them build you a damn shelter. Then vote them out the second time you go to tribal council. You know, I don't understand that at all. And Chicken, I think, was a great character, and I want to see him back. I want him back next season, damn it. That's my desire. I don't care if it's just Chicken and then all new people. I want him back. And according to his Facebook picture, he has six-pack abs. So, god damn it. We need him back in this game. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I told you. That, I, I did, that is a declaration of love. <laughs> yes. And I told everyone. I told you guys that that was about to happen. And it did. I do love chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know what to say besides that, Colin. Yeah. I think that that. Wow. Damn. Yeah, I bet damn. Didn't re- I, damn. damn. I bet y'all did not realize I had such strong opinions. Chicken. Anyways, <laughs> let's move on. We're gonna skip Survivor Micronesia and Johnny Fairplay <laughs> his quit. And actually, if you want to learn more about his quit, I did do an interview with Johnny Fairplay, and he explains how James got nicotine gum, but yet they wouldn't give Johnny Fairplay his medicine to make his face feel better after getting his ass kicked in a wrestling match, and that was part of the reason- by Danny Bonaduce. Yes, by Danny Bonaduce, and that is part of the reason why he quit. If you want to learn more, you can listen to that interview on our YouTube page. But we are going to move to Survivor Gabon. Earth's last Eden and talk about I, one of the few Survivor first boots whose breast you can see on your computer, and that is Michelle Chase. <laughs> I mean, damn, that's quite an introduction. <laughs> um, but um, Michelle, I, I think the most notable thing for me about her was that, yeah, she was hot, but she was so unbearable to live with that she got voted out over Jillian. You know, I mean, God yeah. love Jillian. I, I, you know, I love my token older hags, but God, Jillian would have been a perfect first boot, but she somehow defied the odds. And Michelle, whether it because she was so annoying, so whatever the hell, they voted her out first. Yep. And how annoying do you have to be to be a young, cute, athletic female and then be voted out eight to one? <laughs> Alex, what's I mean, your take on this? Uh, I think I think there may have may have been uh, several factors that contributed to that. May, maybe uh, UTR goddess Susie pulled something because she was talking talking to Gillian about uh, the possibility of the young people taking out the old people. There's the possibility that Michelle uh, made it too obvious that she she was with kenny there she may have just had the uh the thermostat of a lizard because she could not warm up in, the in africa of africa <laughs> well i mean yeah, I, because she, that was one of her big confessionals she's like oh we're at this equator it's supposed to be warm and i'm like uh it probably is warm it probably is you just weigh 20 pounds and <laughs> courtney yates did it better it, actually you know what steven i agree I agree. <laughs> well, anyways, I could picture her being brought back for a second chance season, and really, I, I could just because you know there we go. We need a hot woman, and bam, there we go. Um, and she seemed kind of a little bit goofy in her confessionals. If y'all remember correctly, at the reunion, Michelle she went on this little tangent about how she had like nightmares of termites eating her, which was complete bullshit. She just wanted a little bit of attention. Do y'all remember that? I, I don't even remember that. So that that speaks to how much attention she and, got. And, and and Gabon is like one one of my favorite seasons. I should know. Well, that. go back and watch the reunion, <laughs> and all you listeners out there, go back and watch the reunion. And Michelle talks about how she has these nightmares that the termites are going to eat her, and Jeff gives her the best like, shut up, bro. just it's beautiful, <laughs> and it's kind of like he's it's almost like he's rethinking. I'm never going to allow 
pre-merge brutes to speak at reunions again. As if that's what gave him the idea to just ignore <laughs> pre-merge oh brutes forever. So, is it time to move on to Survivor Token Sheens? I believe it okay, is. Okay, so let's talk about Carolina Eastwood, who is famous for being um, busty. Annoying? I was gonna, bossy. I was going to say busty and bossy. And for saying yes. I'm so Oh, also she got proposed to. Oh yes, we gotta talk about that. And um and being voted out and saying, Oh well, I'm embarrassed. I will say this, if we if you rewatch the first episode of Survivor Token she, she is not as annoying as you remember her. That's all I'm But saying. she's up against um Pierce. Yes. And I, I, I would not be able to live with myself in a world where Sandy is the first boot. I I just couldn't take it. Yeah, uh, because I'd be pissed too. One one of one of the uh one one of the enduring legacies of uh, of Carolina, besides the fact that uh, her name is somehow pronounced Carolina, is I, that honestly, if you, I'm if proud you look of myself intro, for remembering that. <laughs> that it's pronounced if the intro. The, that's yes, she's pronounced Carolina. The intro. That's yeah. Uh, she has she's, one of the best intro shots ever because they show. A picture of a tapir raising its long, weird, flexible nose, and then they cut to Carolina making a face like that <laughs> while she. Runs. I remember and it that is very beautiful. well. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, I, as sad as it sounds, I remember her more for getting proposed to by David Murphy at the Redemption. Yep. And do y'all know what happened to that? Because I know. they they broke up because he didn't he have a thing with Alicia from One World. Yes. Apparently, Alicia Drama. and David hung out together in a bathroom in a Burger King. Whoa. That is what <laughs> I've heard. Whoa. That's... <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> yeah, I have to hand it to Alicia. She knows She knows how to she pick does. up. <laughs> I mean, he's clearly romantic. Anyways. I'm sure. Oh. Carolina, is she coming back for Survivor Second Chances? Yay or nay? Uh, I pray not. You pray not, but couldn't you see Jeff doing it because she's so attractive? Um, no. I mean, we need one token hot first boot, so I'm sure we have enough of those to wear. Mar- or I'm sorry, uh, Carolina won't need to be brought back. <laughs> Alex, we'll get we'll get to Marissa. Well, that's what I was about to say. Marissa, if, I, if there's another con- Survivor contestant that deserves a second chance besides uh, Tumbertina, Marissa Callahan of Survivor Samoa, I um, think easily agree. Easily Amen. fits that mold. I mean, she was voted out for being an intelligent, strong, independent woman, and the people who didn't need no man. Didn't, she didn't need no man. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe if she would have had Russell Hans as a man, and she she did fuck up by saying flat out, "I don't trust you." Even so, though, we all agree, Marissa Callahan. Any other normal season, she makes it far. I don't know if she wins, but god damn it, oh. she makes the merge. Am I right? Easily. Easy. Yeah, I, 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 th- I think she makes it far, and then because uh, because in her confessional, she always gave off the gave off the energy of somebody who was a bit too eager to play. So she would she would play well for a while, and then she would catastrophically screw up, and it would be amazing. I could I could easily picture that actually. Oh, I'd love that. Mm-hmm. Um. <sighs> But Marissa, much as Tumbertina gave rise to Sweet Marissa, gave rise to Russell. But that's not a good thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I love Marissa, but um, unfortunately, she is part of the reason Russell rose to power. So I, it's I'm hard. It's hard for me to be completely sympathetic towards her when, oh, Russell. I, mm. When she got outplayed by Russell and was the first out of many people that season to get completely demolished by Russell. Yeah, mm. but I'd, I'd love to see her play again. Me too, me too. All right, um, is it time to move on to Survivor Nicaragua? So guys, let's talk about Survivor Nicaragua. Oh, we have been joined by Jack. Jack, say hi to everyone. Hey there. And he's going to help us take this first boot podcast home. Anyways, let's talk about... Steven's favorite first boot. <laughs> Steven, go ahead and introduce her. Miss Wendy Jo DeSmit Kohlhoff on the Espada Tribe. Uh, lovely goat farmer from Fromberg, Montana, which is, according to Google Maps, not too far over the state line with Wyoming. 
Um, but anyway, you know, God bless her because she was not going to go far probably ever because she just seemed so zany and out there compared to the rest of the old people tribe. Do you think if she actually talked, it would have made a difference? Well, she did talk. That was just it. That was a lot of it. She Well, she, she was... talked at tribal council, but she says she didn't talk that much around camp and other – Players have confirmed that story. Well, I, I think she, when she talked, it was very uh, grating, possibly. But I, don't, I mean, overall, I think she was a, poor, you know, I kind of felt bad for her. So, I, I agree. I, um, any chance she does well, Alex, in a different season? Uh, I, I don't think there's a chance that she does very well because she's just, uh, she, she's just from a different world than your average survivor contestant not that i know what an average survivor contestant is but uh like goat farming doesn't seem like the kind of occupation where you need that much social skills right uh i i would love to i i would love to theoretically see her uh luck into a good alliance and uh sort of get a redemption story because uh she was more herself cuz she was suppressing her talkative self earlier, but uh, I don't see a realistic chance of that actually happening. And Jack, what's your take on Wendy? All that I really remember of Wendy was her very awkward outfit that she wore on the island, oh, and I the fact that. that she got along with um, Holly Hoffman. But Holly <laughs> Hoffman was also from that like North Dakota, like that kind of area of the United States, so they probably had well, some bond over that. But what did Holly Hoffman have that Wendy did not? I think Holly was more – I want to use the word like down-to-earth, but we all know Holly often isn't really down-to-earth because <laughs> she was kind of crazy that season. I just think she had more social skills. She could seem more normal to people. When Wendy, when you're talking, you're not going to be like, oh, man, this girl is going to be a good ally to me. She just seems like a crazy person who doesn't really understand what show she's on. She's just there like out in the wilderness doing her own thing. <laughs> Is there any chance that Wendy's not a first boot or not a completely early boot? Um, I mean, she could survive maybe a few tribal councils if someone else crashes and burns due to like terrible challenge performance, uh-huh. or is like a just bad person. Like, <laughs> like if Russell Hance is on her tribe, yeah. and we're in the post Redemption Island era, mm-hmm. and they decide not even to try to play with Russell. Then she survives, and then mm-hmm. she's voted out. You know, three rounds later. Or if someone's really rude or offensive, then like, <laughs> take precedence over her. But she just doesn't have the body of work as a person to do well in the show. Well, um, I concur. So we're going to talk about Survivor Redemption Island next. Um, and the first person to lose a duel, and the first person voted out. The most famous, I would argue, Survivor first boot. Francesca. <laughs> is yeah. she a bad player? Did Philip destroy her game? Let's talk about it. And we're only talking about it in terms of Redemption Island, Stephen. Uh, in terms of Redemption Island, she overplayed in terms of um, telling Philip. But at the same time, you know, if you have an idol and if you hypothetically want to be the split vote on a tribe of nine, you need three people at uh-huh. least. Um, so, I mean,. Francesca just she I like to say she got the raw end of the deal, but she also played her hand not so well. So it's a it's a combination, I think. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Well, and I feel like with her overbearing personality, she can't last long, anyways. I mean, unless they're in a season full of you know goats, she doesn't really last too long. I mean, people kind of see right through her. Alex, what's your take on her? Um. I don't know what to say that hasn't already been said. Uh, I think <laughs> that uh, when she when she has a personality conflict, she doesn't know, like like she she tries to go along with it, but I don't know uh, that she has the capability to diffuse it entirely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I, I think I think that she has. Uh, I, I I don't think that she's a particularly bad player or particularly offensive player she she just uh does not have the skills to play very well well wouldn't that make her a bad player if she doesn't have the skills to play well, very well she, she's she's not like I'm, I'm saying that 
She's not a Wendy Joe. Right. She's not a Wendy Joe. <laughs> but she is uh yeah. Um she she's also no Siri. <laughs> 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 well, I feel like that intellectually, someone like Francesca could play the game like on paper. She would understand, but then she just lacks, you know, the understanding of the social aspects of it. Jack, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to mention that for to be a successful survivor player, it takes a ton of like, different aspects um, to be great, like being really socially, have good self awareness, understanding the strategy. So in some aspects, Francesca is better than other people. Like she understood the strategy more than other people on her season. But then her just self awareness and coming off too strong and not knowing when to like reel it back a little bit is what caused her to get screwed mm-hmm. in her season. So she... uh, wait Oh go ahead. Oh you can go ahead. Well I was gonna say we mentioned earlier how Peter Harkley was a victim of Rob's wrath and that in a normal season without Rob there, Peter could have gone further. Is that the same case with Francesca? I think, yeah, because when in the beginning of the episode, she sort of had, she like pulled Christina. was her name? Was it Christina? Yeah, it was yeah, Christina. Yeah. She had some sway with certain people, but then you had Rob, a veteran who like knew what was going on and just had more experience in these type of social games. So he could recognize that someone like Francesca was a threat to his game, whereas other people wouldn't realize that. So I think having someone more experienced was a huge detriment to her game. And since we haven't been talking about All-Star Games, let's talk about kind of her time in Caramon, just because I feel like it's relevant, because it's the only time we've had the same person we voted out twice. I feel like her being voted out in Caramon, though, if anything... really kind of, for me, proved how bad of a player she was because she couldn't navigate around the Philip icon. Like, being beat by Boston Rob is one thing, but to me, being beat by Philip is something completely different. Yeah, and she actually had a lot going for her because outside of the game, she was part of that New York City, like, wine and cheese club, Survivor yeah. Night thing. So she had a lot of pre-existing relationships going into the show that we saw on the season that she easily could have used to her advantage, but mm-hmm. she took more of a stance on... She focused more on getting like being a Phillips enemy more than being her friend's allies. Mm-hmm. So I think if she just like put the Philip thing away and like didn't even like bring it up as an issue. So she doesn't in her mind she shouldn't even show that it exists. Mm-hmm. Instead of but she just went after Philip and like made it awkward between them two. And then she just didn't navigate her situation yeah. well. And honestly if I'm Cochran if I'm someone else, I'm keeping Philip or Francesco because you know you know Philip He's a go, and you know exactly what he's going to do. Right. And, I mean, the players that were brought back were supposedly all-stars, and, you know, all-stars get rid of threats. That's what they do. Anyways, are we ready to move on to South Pacific? Yes. <laughs> All right. Now, does anyone have a huge love for Shamar? Simhar. Simhar. Because I know someone who did, and that was Ozzy. Ozzy thought her poetry was amazing, and it really touched him deeply. I saw her as someone who just wasn't meant to play the damn game. She, yeah. She messed up the challenge. Um, I mean, Cochran was able to prove himself more valuable than her. Steven, go ahead and let's talk about her. Um, so I will preface this by saying I am a major Cochran fan, so I have to thank Semhar for being the first boot instead. Uh-huh. Um, but, I, you know, on re- in retrospect, I, I enjoyed Semhar for her one-episode stay um, because she was so out there and she was so obviously not meant to play. Um, uh-huh. I mean, you, you, you saw in her uh, bit on Redemption Island in episode two where she just has this spoken word. I don't even want to call it a poem. I guess it's more of a lament. Where yeah. she's just like, I don't understand how they could be so cold-hearted. Um, so, I mean... You're playing Survivor, bitch. <laughs> I don't know if I would go that far, but... <laughs> yeah, um, you know... Yeah, I mean... It's hard for me to muster up feelings about Semhar without mustering up feelings about other people as well. Mm-hmm. Could I go into more detail about that? Um, yes, because my... My appreciation for Semhar stems from a, I don't want to call it a disdain, but a, a frustration with Jim. 
Um, and also my gratefulness of her being a first boot stems from my Cochrane fanboy thing. <laughs> so it's a, it's a multitude of things that give me my feelings towards Simhar. <laughs> and uh, Cash, what's your take on this wonderful first boot? Well, I remember watching the cast assessment video that comes out before every season, and Jeff says, I don't think Semhar uh, has any idea what she's doing out here. And my first reaction is, well, then why did you cast her? And then her episode three a uh, poem about how she she wants to have uh you know <laughs> 10 10 of her uh boyfriend's kids if if that's what he wanted because you know love and i was just like okay this is this is why they cast her for the lulls <laughs> <laughs> and and so yeah i i appreciate i i appreciate her short stay on the show for the lulls and i'm not sure that I, I don't think Redemption Island needed to drag it out to uh, a three-episode stay, but, uh, you know, sure, yeah, she's memorable enough. <laughs> and, Jack, what'd you take on her? Did you like um, her as much as everyone else seems to? South Pacific was in a season I particularly enjoyed, <laughs> so I don't have <laughs> that fond of a memory in regards to this season. So I remember what Simhar looks like, but I couldn't say it. I remember anything about her game. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, I can talk. Alicia <laughs> wants to say something. Okay, Alicia can, yeah, Alicia can talk. <laughs> Alright, I'll give her the headset. Alright, and Alicia is joining us for a little bit. Okay, wait, so Semhar was like the first boot? Yeah, we're talking about the first boots. Okay, oh my god, Semhar was like the written word poetry girl, right? Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, okay, all I have of, like, I have this vision of her in her ridiculous <laughs> tall socks trying to, like, <laughs> throw the coconuts like 20 <laughs> feet above her head and failing fucking miserably and everyone was pissed at her because she like volunteered because she thought she could play basketball with like heavy ass coconuts and she had spindly <laughs> little arms and couldn't hang <laughs> <laughs> and that is her take on Simhar and you know what I think that we've covered all the base so let's move on to Survivor One World which we had a medevac but Courtney was actually not the first person voted out. So we're going to talk about Nina. And if any viewers out there want to learn more about Nina, I did, in fact, interview her. And I don't know how many people know this, but Nina was actually part of a Landmarks um, case against the NYPD in terms of sexism in the workplace and helped set the standard for the modern-day rules against sexual harassment in the workplace. Anyways, moving on to something completely different, let's talk about her somewhat inability to crack the five alliance, the five girl alliance that dominated one world. Steven. Um, Nina, these are the things I remember about her. She was a cop. Um, she had a very busted up face from that first immunity challenge. She got, um, and she really was not a fan of cat. So that, those are probably off the top of my head. What I remember about Nina. Cash. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what I remember about her. I I just remember that uh, something about her was likable, and uh, also I think that something something about that five alliance looked very strong, and uh, so that gave her underdog appeal already. So I like her, but I don't remember what it was that I liked. Well, I remember I thoroughly in, enjoyed her, and I remember I was actually rooting for a cat to go instead of her. But I mean. That's how Survivor goes, Jack. What I really remember about Nina, is it Nina was her name? Nina. Yeah. All right. Is she like just looked like an older woman before the challenge, but then after the challenge, she looked like she got in like a bar fight with Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't exactly realize what happened, but her face was entirely cut up. She was like bruised and not completely dirty. But well, during my interview with her, she talks about how on the walk to camp. Um, the five girls made their alliance, and then when they arrived at camp, Nina looked up at Monica and just went, holy shit, I think we're already out. And of course, they didn't show that on TV, but I feel like Nina was one of those people who was just kind of doomed from day one, and I would actually love to see her back. I don't necessarily know if she could win, but I think she could definitely avoid being a first boot. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. She doesn't, she wasn't as terrible as some first boots, and she so showed some promise, 
but I think, yeah, I agree that the on the walk to camp, the five-person lines being formed, it's hard to combat that, especially three days in, because mm-hmm. even if you don't like the people in your alliance, if you're a part of that, it just doesn't make any sense to go against it on the exactly. first the first tribal. Exactly, so, which is why when we play Jack, we're going to make a five-person alliance on day one. <laughs> Before the game even starts. Before the game even starts. Is Alicia there? Does she want to comment, or was she just popping in? Uh, she was just me. popping in because she right. knew who Semhar was and I didn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Does anyone um, else have anything to add about poor Nina? No? Okay, so That's let's move on to Survivor Philippines, which had, I think, one of the most memorable recent first boots, which is Zane Knight. And I don't know how many people know this, but until Carter's boot episode, Zane Knight had more confessionals than he did. Zane had something like 11 confessionals in his one episode in the game. He was a huge character. He tried to blindslide Russell Swan, but in a moment of weakness, he told his tribe, hey, vote me out, and he didn't seem to recover from that. Steven, let's talk well, about Zane. First of all, shout out to Zane from Virginia. Um, but second of all, Zane, I I don't know what to feel about Zane because part of me absolutely adores him for being kind of a wreck. But another part of me is not sure how to feel because uh, I, I believe his whole vote me out plan was, in his words, to get people to say, no, we don't want to vote you out. And to, for him to like forge further alliances. Um, Which was retarded. Well, yeah, he completely missed the boat on that one. Um, and an, I, I believe another shining moment was he told Malcolm, and I believe it might have been Russell, um, that he, in fact, already had alliances with everyone else. So just wanted to let you know, I'm also aligned with everyone else in the tribe. So, you know, telling everyone that doesn't necessarily bode well for your chances. So Zane shot himself in the foot, asked you to vote him out. Ask you to vote him out, and then try to blindside a guy who's really big and strong. Yeah. Holy shit, that's a legacy for a first boot. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and not not to mention, he also had some great quotes like uh, the Frankenstein saying, comparison, King me, Frankenstein King me, and the onion thing. Yeah, I kind of remember <laughs> the, that. The, the, remember the that. more you, the, the the more layers you peel back, the more you cry. <laughs> <laughs> I want Zane back. Am I the only one here who wants Zane back? Oh, I don't, I no. love him back because I, I think, want him back for the I think, most. I think he's kind of, in a sense, almost a parody of Russell Hans. <laughs> because you have this southern guy who is not necessarily the most in touch with the rest of his tribe, and he's just playing so hard, so fast. And then towards the end, it's like, uh, actually, you know, you guys should vote me out. <laughs> so, I mean, it's crazy in three days someone <laughs> I want I want to see him back on the show with Johnny Fairplay because <gasps> they're both first boots and they're both from the same hometown yes, they Virginia. Are. I, I could picture that anyways Jack what's your take on yeah I think Zane I would love to see him back. I doubt that he could win a season, but he definitely could make it further than he did. I think he could easily he... make merge easily. Yeah, I just he needs to like dial back on the cigarettes and work out, <laughs> and mm-hmm. he could make a very iconic player more than so than he already is. All right. Any other final thoughts on the wonderful Zane Knight? Okay, so we're not going to talk about Survivor Caramel. We already, you know. Uh, went on a little monologue about Francesca. So we're going to talk about Survivor Blood versus Water. And what's interesting about this, okay, so <laughs> do we talk about Laura Boham, who was voted out and came back into the game? Do we talk about Marissa Peterson, who was the first person actually voted out? Or do we talk about Rupert Boham, who took Laura's spot? I say, fuck it, let's talk about all three of them real quick. Yes. Okay. Laura Boham. Well, what about Candace? She was also voted out. Oh shit. Well, That's well, true. Yeah, but Candace wasn't um She she was voted out but uh but she was like she was day one. She, she was voted out day one, but Laura was voted out first. Laura and Rupert took her place and then Candace got voted. Wait. No. Laura got voted out, then no. Candace got voted out, then Rupert got the option to switch with her. 
Holy Jeez. shit. Th- this is part of the glory also, of the And also of Marissa the got Trump voted out of tribal. Season. Yeah. Everything was such a cluster. Okay. So we all agree it was a cluster. Well, let me just ask questions. Laura, Rupert, Candace, Marissa. Could any of those four people win? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Who? Candace. Is that Candace could win? Okay, let's talk about um, that, Jack. Explain um, your Candace look. Candace Candace's biggest gripes to her like coming back in season and winning is just her past games where both times she's flipped on her alliance in Cook Islands when she did the mutiny thing and then here's just villains where she tried to work with the villains. So she has the skill set to do well and maybe win a game. It's just if people judge her based on what she's done in the past, then she's going to get screwed like we saw here. Well, I also think it's important to note that Candace was not originally in the cast. It was RC. Yeah. And then when RC got removed, they flew Candace in. And do you think that doomed her from the start, guys? I think yes. I read somewhere that mm-hmm. a lot of the people just like agreed that Candace was going to be the first one since she just was like a late member. Mm-hmm. Right. So let's talk about Laura then. Laura Boneham. She was the first one voted out. She says it was because of Rupert. I say it's because she's a socially awkward middle-aged woman who's out of shape. Oh, don't don't hate on Laura Bonham. I don't she hate. I don't hate on her. I'm just you know I'm speaking the <laughs> truth, which is what the uh, viewers pay me to do. Stephen, do you want to defend her? Go ahead. And oh, try I, to I, her. no, not defend her. I, I love her as a character, but she makes sense as a first boot. But um, uh, excuse me. Um, I mean, first of all, I have to commend Rupert for swapping with her. Maybe he realized that we had already had three seasons of him and we didn't need any more. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we hadn't really seen his wife much, so she she gave us a great journey um, for her, however many episodes she was there. Um, but, I don't know. I felt bad for Laura Bonham because right off the start they booted her from the newbie tribe, and then Rupert switched uh, basically against the ire of everyone else. And you know, you get all these confessionals when Laura Bonham comes back to camp. We wanted to play with Rupert, not his wife. Yeah, especially Jervis, I believe, was very outspoken. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, in okay. that regard, I felt bad for her. So, let's talk. Or right, does anyone else have any opinion on Laura? Anything that hasn't been covered, Jack? What do you think of Laura? I remember. Could she win Survivor? No, I remember. <laughs> going into the season, I remember reading. It was either the Jeff Rose Caps' cast assessment or some interview he did with, like, EW or People magazine where he's saying that Laura's – one of her biggest downfall would be her social game and that she sort of has, like, an uppity or smug sense to her based on the fact that she's Rupert's wife mm-hmm. and, like, has already been on the show. Like, oh, I came out for these family visits and Rupert is so famous. So she just comes across, like, acting like she's bigger than other people. Hey, do you think the newbies – um? Caught onto that right away. I don't think that was her main detriment, <laughs> but <laughs> if she if she wasn't so out of shape and not good at challenges, yeah. I'm sure it would have come up at some point. Well, actually, if you remember correctly, she wasn't too too bad at the challenges. She was just out of shape. Yeah, yeah. She. I remember her not being actually horrible at the challenges, but you know, it was just that she cut. Also, she didn't really gel well. Um, I remember as she actually got snuffed. Um, she told Vetus that he was going. She's a horrible oh, player. Let's let's just, yeah, let's oh. just say this right now. She was a horrible survivor player. <laughs> she told Vetus he was going. She was like, hey, I'm making an executive decision. We're voting you out, Vetus, and we're sorry. Like, that's why Vetus <laughs> survived was because the two girls, Allura and Kat, shot themselves in the foot. Yeah. Although Kat, you could argue, shot herself in the foot repeatedly. With very various different guns, but um, you know, uh, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Anyways, let's go ahead and let's talk about Rupert. Arr! I like Rupert. Uh-huh. I don't hate him like you guys. However, <laughs> he was a complete idiot for bumble fucking that challenge. I'm I'm honestly amazed that he did that, and I guess I shouldn't be. <laughs> um. Uh- I, I I appreciate uh I, I I appreciate Rupert as a character and I but uh, I have had three seasons of him already and more of three seasons than I have of most of the people who have been there for three seasons because he made it pretty much towards the end 
of all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he got eighth well, in Pearl Islands, he got fourth in All Stars, and sixth in Heroes Villains. Well, something I've yeah. always commented on, which is people that hate Rupert. He, even though other survivors claim to annoy him, he clearly has a decent social game because he's one of the few people who played three times and made the merge three times. Like he does bring something to the table despite all the hate. Yeah, I, I think. I, I think that uh, I think that him switching with Laura was uh, the hero in him, I guess, because mm-hmm. uh, of course he wants to wants to have his wife play because you know she hasn't gotten to and he has. Uh, so I, I don't think there was anything like calculated about that. Uh, but I do think that uh, flubbing the challenge like he did. Yeah, the the duel that was uh I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it was just it was awful. Um uh, Jack, do you have anything on Rupert? I enjoy Rupert when if you like if he had just played in Pearl Islands and All Stars. He was fine on TV, but I just felt like the producers were constantly putting like like you guys love Rupert, Rupert. Let's put him back. Let's bring him back. Well, I think if he had just played those two times, it would have been a fine person. <laughs> and it, it just, and interest- I got over the whole pirate. Like I'm a hero. Everyone loves me. Like I'm gonna wear tie dye shirt stick. <laughs> and him being voted out early, or when he got did in All Stars, if that's where his story ends, he actually has a pretty good legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, another interesting tidbit about Rupert: um, the Israeli edition of Survivor. I believe it was their third season. Actually, had Rupert come out to the Philippines as a reward. So Rupert transcends American Survivor. Apparently, <laughs> he is that iconic that he is a reward in foreign survivors. All right, I have something to say from Alicia. Okay. She wants to comment that the reason that she met me and met all you guys is because she saw the ad for Survivor Chronicles and Rupert's AMA. So if it wasn't for Rupert, then she wouldn't be in this community. And so she just wanted to let that be known. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why she says Rupert is the best. <laughs> well, I guess that's something. Let's talk about the last first boot of this Blood vs. Water season, which is Marisa Peterson. Um, Marissa. 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 Some people... We've already had a Marisa. Yeah, Marisa and Marissa. Marissa. Anyways, some people claimed... Her being voted out was, you know, Brad being sexist. I think it was Marissa saying right off the bat, oh, Brad, if you're on my tribe, uh, I don't want you to be on my tribe. <laughs> well, I, I think no. that played a part into it because, I mean, we saw the same thing happen with Francesca and we saw it happen with uh, Christina in South Pacific. You run your m- uh, mouth on the opening at the opening of the game and it bites you in the ass. This, is, this isn't a, uh, a first boot, but uh... – Christine from South Pacific had the same problem. Yeah, that's what I meant, Christine. I'm sorry. Temporary players. Yeah, temporary players, exactly. <laughs> um, I appreciate Marissa for what she brought in the fuck you, Brad Culpepper. Right. Um, but, and I, I, I think she was partially robbed, but I don't have a strong enough opinion on her to, to, to you know, say, oh, damn, she got screwed over. So, Jack, do you have an opinion on um, Risa from Flavors Water? Yeah. Um, I pretty much just agree with what's been said. Do you guys want to come back? Because I wouldn't mind. I, I would like to see how she plays five years from now. I think she could yeah, be. I think, um, I think she could be. Her a, being young player. and immature had a lot going against her because she's definitely fit in athletics so she could do well in challenges mm. so i think if she was just more mature, mature and more socially aware that she could do much better yeah i concur all right so are we ready to move on to the very last uh first boot of all time well not yeah. of all time until you know <laughs> six months from now roughly let's talk about survivor kage on and the wonderful Coach of the, what is it, Miami Merlin? Uh, president. Merlin, yeah, the wonderful president of <laughs> the baseball. David Sampson. We're talking about David Sampson, okay? Mm-hmm. Anyways, I feel like he got a little bit robbed. And in really? Any, and in any really? normal season, the person who throws the fucking rice gets voted out. Or the no, person who completely no, that ruins. That didn't happen yet. Yeah, that didn't or, happen yet. Hold on. Or the person who completely sinks your challenge right off the bat. 
while David did not play a perfect game, I uh, liked him. I don't. I I wanted. I don't think he could eat, win Survivor, but I think on a given a different chance, he could fly under the radar for a little bit. And uh, I hear you guys arguing with me, so go ahead, Stephen. Explain to me why I'm wrong and why David deserves um, to go. So I could. I have a laundry list actually. Um, okay, go ahead. First, first thing, uh, he clearly was not familiar enough with the show to understand that the weakest person vote off was not a legitimate vote off. Uh, there's 18 people, six people per tribe. They're not going to have a cast of 15. Um, so right off the bat, you pick the strong guy to leave saying you're playing for day 39 on day one. Um, you know, you just don't do that. Um, I think. Um, can I like button real quick? Yeah, go Sorry. ahead. I don't agree. I, like I agree with Steven that I don't agree with David's decision. But I read an interview, I think he did with Rob Cisternino, that in part of his mind he thought it might have been a challenge that those three uh, go into. So that's why he picked Garrett. And and that's the thing is I actually believe that David picked Garrett because of those reasons because uh, David said he could tell they weren't going to swap because they were all wearing the same color. And he could tell they wouldn't be voted out because that would only leave 15 people. However, why didn't David flat out say – I'm a member of the Brains Tribe, and as a Brains Tribe, I know, Jeff, you're not sending these people home. You might be sending them on a challenge. I pick Garrett. Then suddenly, it's completely justified. Why didn't he just fucking say it? Why? Why didn't he just flat out say that, and he would have been fine? And I think Garrett wouldn't have had, you know, the anger towards him that led to both of them being voted out. <laughs> Why didn't he say it, Alex? Um, I don't know. But but I, I can tell you so, some other things. I think that I think that uh, um, uh, David Sampson was kind of was kind of doomed from the start just because he's uh, he, um, he he I, he doesn't strike me as the kind of person that's uh, able to hide his scheming mm-hmm. and uh, like like he look he looks like he's tr- he's actively trying to screw you over. That and and he also, uh, just because uh, of course uh, there is a vast archive of uh, uh, things in the sports media reporting on him, and he just comes off as an asshole so many times. Uh, like he he, I I believe uh, in the re in, in the past couple of years he got uh, Miami taxpayers to build. Him a new a new stadium, and, and that then was actually what he listed on his bio about fucking the taxpayers over. That's actually what he listed as his greatest accomplishment in his bio, I think. Yeah, and that is not the kind of and uh, that is Russell Hance kind of uh, kind of bragging about your uh, bragging about how duplicitous you are. So I don't think he had a shot at, at winning anyway. And I think it, it's kind of it's kind of glorious that he uh, went out first. And I well, also have to thank him for sparing Jatia. <laughs> he, I was just worried that Jatia would still be in it at this point, and we would all hate her. Jack. <gasps> okay, okay, Stephen, you cannot defend her. Oh no, I'm not defending okay, her okay. as a player. She's a great character, though. Because I'm like Stephen. I swear to God, I will vote <laughs> you out of the podcast if you defend her as a player. No, no. I know you love the Hags, but. Come on. She is not even a hag. I know, but <laughs> you pick the worst people. You just like Survivor Sucks. You pick some random, like Edna May. Oh, Edna May is a good player now. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Jack, mm-hmm. let's talk about David Sampson. Um, I agree with most of the points that have been said. He. Who did he say? Oh, yeah, I remember it was him and Cass, like, walking on the beach, and he was like, we have to vote out, we have to vote out Garrett. We have to do it. And Cass just like, as we know, Cass isn't the most reasonable person, but even in that situation, she was the voice of reason to like tame David down and be like, no, we don't have to vote out Garrett. He's our strongest guy. We can wait and vote out Jutia right now. I think he was just very too headstrong, too stubborn, and wasn't willing to go with the flow. I think maybe the leader thing got to his head super quickly, and the fact that he's been a leader in his job, that he felt like he should just be in control. Because leaders suck on Survivor, like, and people that are like, oh, I'm a natural lawyer, I'm so, everyone loves me. They always get voted out really early, which I think is awesome. Mm. <laughs> one, one, other, one other thing about him uh, is that uh, the Marlins have had a history of trading away great players and getting oh, yeah. 
hardly <laughs> anything in return. So uh, deciding to give up Garrett out of, out of anybody, no matter what his reasoning was, was just so appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if David was like the president back in the day. But I remember when the Red Sox got Josh Beckett, and then they proceeded to win like three World Series in the next like eight years due to him. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I think we've done a pretty good job of covering all the first boots. This will certainly be a long, interesting podcast. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Jack, for joining us at the very end of it. And I want to thank everyone who has taken the time to listen to this. I think it's going to be like just over an hour and 45 minutes long. And we get to update it at some point in time in the future for Survivor. We'll have a 29th and 30th season. And be sure to listen to all of our weekly discussions, which happen or which get posted late Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. And look for more player interviews because more of those are coming down the pipe. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.